All right, good morning. <laughs> My name's Steve Baca. Um, this is an overview of vSphere Core 4 performance troubleshooting. Um, so let's go right into it. We've got five sections here. The first section is ESX Top Overview. So uh, we're going to go over ESX Top and how it works. Then, the, just like the name of the session says, we're going to go through all four of the main performance p things that you would need if for a virtual machine. You know, CPU, memory, networking, and storage. Sometimes I call them the four food groups because uh, that's essentially what it is. So let's start off with ESX Top. Now, ESX Top is the old top utility from the vSphere, well, not from vSphere, but really from Unix way back in the 90s. I remember using this way back a long time ago. And so what VMware did is they took Top, and they've, you know, which is freeware, and they've modified it. Now, keep in mind that if you look at ESX Top from, let's say, during the vSphere 4.0 time, or 3.5, or 4.1, or 5, each version, VMware changes it a little bit. You know, like now, if you look, there's vSAN information in there, uh, VAI information in there. So there's a lot of information there. And it's found, and it's built in. Even in the old 3.5 time frames, you get to a prompt, you type ESX Top, and there it is. Now, the refresh, refresh on that is every five seconds. So every five seconds, it'll, it, it, it does an update, uh, which is different than your performance charts, which are every 20 seconds. Now, when you first start up ESX Top, you're looking at the default view of CPU. Um, and it's, it's kind of a different tool, so you don't necessarily have a prompt, but if you type in an N, up comes the networking. Or if you type in uh, M, up, pump, up cops memory. So, um, and, and, and we're going to talk about each, you know, uh, several of the, you know, at least the main fields. One of the exceptions then is disk, in which there's three different views. And so when we get to the storage section, we'll talk about what each one of those views are. Now, one of the things that's going to show up in ESX Top is in, in, in the top part, uh, you'll see all of these what are called uh, um, processes or worlds. And with that, the, the top ones will be the host itself. And then below that will be the virtual machines. Well, well, what if you just want to see the virtual machines? So if you do a shift V or capital V, the only things that will show up are the actual virtual machines themselves. So um, that is very useful. Now, a very useful feature of ESX Top is help. So if I, I type the letter H, it brings up a screen that looks kind of si a little similar to this. And it's like, what are all my options? And it'll say like X for vSAN and stuff like that. So, and then when you hit the space bar and you go back into your prompt and then you hit like M for memory. So if you're not sure where to go, you know, go for help. You know, hit the H key. Or if you kind of mess stuff up, if you're changing the fields around, you can always Q for quit and then come right back in because it'll go right back to the defaults unless you save those settings. You know, sometimes, you know, and, and that's another option is you, maybe you specifically want some... Uh, Settings saved. CPU. So let's take a look at the first one. Um, and CPU is, affects a lot. And it's very important when it comes to performance. Now, you might recognize this slide from 5.1. Uh, so in the 5.1 resource management guide, uh, that's kind of, we, we brought it back in from way back when. Um, but it's, it's an excellent slide because it says, well, when it comes to these processes, where, you know, how does it work? Well, you obviously start with new. So if, if I have a world that wants to you know, schedule, you know, you've got this new process. Now, ideally, that process wants to run. You know, and when it says uh, run, obviously you're running on the CPU. But, it, but a process, though, due to certain factors, can be in different states. So what you can end up with then is, um, um, as an example, let's say you have more than one CPU. Uh, so you've got, and what I mean by more than one CPU, I'm not talking about the host, I'm talking about 
a virtual machine. So you have two virtual CPUs, or three or four, you know, more than one, you can end up what, in what's called the co-stop state, and which one of those other, the, those worlds needs to start. And so what will happen then is it'll go in the co-stop state. And it's kind of fascinating how it, especially if you look at ESX top, you can see it swapping back and forth um, between the co-stop and the ready state. Now, the ready state you know, simply means that it wants that particular process is ready and, and it's kind of waiting its turn to get on to run on the CPU. It's what's called CPU ready. Um, so, and, and then it can go between dispatch and, and, and deschedule saying, okay, it's my turn to get on the CPU. Uh, so it can be a really good thing and then it can also be, you know, uh, a bad thing depending on how much percent ready you actually have. Let's go into some of the performance indicators. So on, on your left side here, here you've got you know, some of the key performance indicators for the ESXi host. Um, you know, ready time, I mean, if, if this is, in a sense, this is one of our key performance indicators of the higher it is, the, the, the worse it is, that's some, one thing we want to look at. CPU utilization, you know, how busy is that CPU? That's another factor that you'd want to take a look at. And then your load average. And then on the right side, what about for my virtual machines? So on the virtual machine, percent ready time, again, that's when a process is waiting to get onto the CPU. It's ready to be scheduled, and it's, it's like, okay, there's another, somebody else is on that CPU before I am. And so it's, it's waiting for its turn uh, to get on the CPU. And then you have percent co-stop. And the percent co-stop is kind of interesting um, later on, you're going to see that uh, I've got a slide in which if it's above 3%, that's a problem. Um, and what that problem tells you, and, and it's, it's kind of interesting, because the question is, is how many CPU, virtual CPUs should my virtual machine have? You know, a lot of times that's like the question you, uh, you're asking, you know, the, de the developer will say, well, uh, you know, they don't know. And like, well, how many CPUs can you give me? That's usually the answer, right? <laughs> how much memory can you give me? Well, the problem is they'll always usually ask for way too much, you know, because they're, 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 that's, they're, that's how we've always been geared from the physical days. The more CPU, the more memory, you know. I remember back in the days of the physical world working for Sun, um, oh, the solution, oh, just buy more CPU, buy more memory. You know, that'll fix everything, right? And, you know, that was always kind of the solution. Well, in this day and age, that's not a, always a good thing. And so what will happen is with percent co-stop, if that number is above 3%, that basically means that particular VM is, has too many virtual CPUs. And that's, what, uh, that's why it's a, it's a very important factor. Now, if you only have one CPU, it'll be zero. So uh, that's kind of how that works. Swap, percent swap weight and memory limited. Now, the percent swap weight is actually a, there saying, I am waiting for memory. Now, that's, it, it's kind of interesting. We'll have a slide on this later um, on as well when we get to the memory section, because that's a great factor that says, um, really, I don't have enough memory. I'm waiting on memory before my CPU can run, because you'll see, if that number is high, you'll see the percent ready time is low, and the utilization is low, and, uh, and, and that's typically not a good thing. And then the memory, percent MLMTD, yeah, Yes, that, that's another factor, yes. Right. Uh, hey, good points, yes. So, and I... <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate that, yeah. But yes, that's another thing. Yeah, you have too many CPUs, good point. Um, percent MLMTD, so the memory limited is, is, is this. Um, you can set a limit on your you know, for the CPU, for your virtual machine. And, but that one's usually kind of easy. You know, you go in, uh, you know, edit settings, and you see, oh, yeah, we set this, uh, you know, limit on my CPU. But another thing to think about with the percent MLMTD is this. You look there, and there's no limit on, on your virtual machine. 
and you go and you say, well, wait a minute, um, why, is that, why is that high? Maybe, and, and what it is, is it's on your resource pool. So that VM is within that resource pool, and that's the one that a lot of people forget about. So on this slide, we, you know, they've obviously doctored it up, and you've got your percent used, and then the percent ready. And the percent ready part, I always like to say it should be less than 10%. And kind of the easy analogy of percent ready is if you were to go to the grocery store right now in your hometown, um, and you walk in, you want some bacon and eggs, right? And there, there's, there's nobody there, right? So you grab the bacon and eggs, you're ready to pay. Think of the cashier as the CPU. And the CPU is just sitting there, yeah, there's nobody in line. So you go right up. So when you are ready to get on to the CPU, it, that number is really small. But let's say it's, you know, the day before Thanksgiving. And you go to the supermarket and places, you know, jam-packed. Everybody's buying the big turkey and stuff like that. When you're ready to pay, all of a sudden there's this huge line in the queue, right? And so, when you, so that number would be really high. And it, so essentially what happens in our worlds here is there's way too many VMs competing for that CPU. Just like there's way too many people competing for that checkout person. And so that number is going to be high. So if it's higher, than, I always like to say higher than 10%, that's way too high. So again, you know, what is co-stop? So when a VM with multiple virtual CPUs must stop processing on one or more virtual CPUs. That's where that comes into play. And with the co-stop, then you have a skew, and a lot of times that can be due to, notice like it, it talks about the, the virtual CPUs co-start when that slow sibling begins to make progress. Um, so there's a, there's a whole skew that goes into, uh, that you need to take into account. So how do I resolve this? And, and it's just kind of like what we talked about, and that is having the right number of virtual CPUs for your virtual machine. You know, it's, it's that mama bear, papa bear. You know, you want it just right. You know, too much and too little are going to cause you problems. So memory key performance indicators, and, and again, the, 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 the slides, we've got to condense this down a little bit because it's just a half hour presentation. <laughs> uh, but what we have for on the memory side, so when I type in M for memory, here I can see the amount of physical memory I have, my PMEM. And of that PMEM of 4,095, I always like to say, that's the amount you can kick. You know, and obviously this is, you know, not a real physical, you know, like you have in your production environment. It's going to be a much, much larger number. Um, but it, it, it does pay, um, show the point. You know, I have physically 4,095 megs of physical RAM. And of that total amount, the VM kernel is taking up uh, 904 of that. And, and then, then other processes are taking up 1,228. Now, notice the number free there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that's the amount of physical memory that's free. And then the min free part then is that's what we're striving for. And we're going to see that in just a second. So that's that amount that when our high state goes into the, the different states, it goes from, let's say, high to clear to, you know, to soft to hard to low. When it changes those different states, that's where that comes into play. And it deals with that that the min free value versus the amount we actually have free. The VMK mem, that's the, man, the managed memory, and like we said, we talked about that min free value. So at what point does that change? And so what you've got then is when I, so the, I always like to say the high state is, you know, you've got plenty of memory. So, you, you know, the, the free amount is pretty high, and then your, your min free value is, is well below that. So at some point in time, as the virtual machines are taking up and using the processes, um, it can go down to the clear state. So the clear state is where you have 100% of min free. And you know, so you'll, you'll watch as those values get closer to that value. Now, what sometimes will happen is, let's say you can start a, pro, you know, a process, and it can go yeah. slam down and kind of go back up. 
Uh, now the soft state is where you begin to balloon. And I always like to say ballooning is a good warning sign. You know, because the last thing you want to be in is the swap. Uh, with ballooning, that's where you want to go and buy more physical memory. That's the time to buy. It's not really when you're buying swap or buy, add more physical host. Now, if you go below 32% of that min free value, and, and again, that min free value, is, there's a formula, if you go into the resource management guide, that talks about, well, based upon the amount of physical memory of that box, because it, some of you might remember back in, you know, 3.5, 4.0, it was like 6%. Anything below that was ballooning. And then 4%, and you go into swapping and so forth, you know, swapping and ballooning. Well, it's, it's because of the large amount of memory you have, that has kind of changed over time. And so now it's a formula based upon the amount of physical memory you have. And then you've got below that the hard state, which is transparent page sharing, compressing, and swapping. And, and what the engineers have figured out is that when you go into swapping, it's, it's faster to compress that by uh, um, compress it first and then swap it, and that's helped with performance because, and then the last thing you want to be is in the blocking state, which is kind of fascinating. I've tried to get down there to that state, and what happens is this. Because ESX top needs to process, if the block is basically, say, the ESX IO is saying, I'm not, I'm not giving any new pa uh, um, pages of memory out anymore. And so what will happen is you're looking at ESX top and you expect to see it, but guess what? Do who doesn't get any more processing? ESX top. So it's, it, you really won't see that in ESX top because the host is just starving for memory. Um, now, um, again, so when you're on this screen, um, if I, I can type in the J field. Um, and, well, if I want to see the ballooning. So you type in F, uh, um, you type in F first for fields, and then within the field screen, you can see that there'll be a bunch of different options. And here I can type in J because I want to see the ballooning information. One of the problems with top, since it's such an old utility, um, that it just truncates across, off the screen and so you don't see what's there. Now on the ballooning, here I can see the, amount, the current amount of ballooning and I can see that there's a VM right there that has ballooned out. Now you might see the swapping numbers and those are the total number. Uh, and we'll, We'll talk about swapping in just a second, but here I can see the ballooning. And notice the MCTL question mark. The Y there means that the ballo that ballooning is enabled. Now the first thing that requires is that VMware tools has to be loaded in order for it to balloon. And then beyond that, you've got um, and then when you do go down into like the the soft and the hard state, that'll actually go to an, an end. No. Uh, configured memory per the virtual machine. So when you allocate memory for your virtual machine, and in this case they allocated, you know, roughly about a gig for those two VMs, and it looks like about 256 for the VMs below that. Um, and so of that allocation, then you can see how much is granted, and and the granting there is, as an example, based upon the operating system, whether it's you know Linux or uh, Windows, it's, you know, what it's grabbed, and, and the different OS's do it in a different way uh, to kind of, you know, summarize that, and so that, that number might not always be high, and sometimes that's based upon your OS. And then you have the physical memory that's held for other virtual machines. So as that, that memory is ballooned out by the balloon driver, it can be held and used by other virtual machines. All right. Then we have our active memory. Oops, let me go back. There you go. And then this is the amount of active memory per virtual machine, which is the TCHD. Um, now, you know, when it comes to compression, the reality is, is you're going to see compression when it swaps. And so in the interest of time, you can see these fields here of caching. Uh, but I'm going to go right to the swapping page. And as you can imagine, the swapping is, is bad. And here you've got a total amount of, you know, total memory that's swapped for all the VMs on the host. Now, the current swapping, because, you know, again, this is the swapping that the system wants to do at this point in time, is done to the right. 
And what's, what's kind of interesting about this is, um, I always like to say, you know, the swapping out is, is, is fine, but, you know, it's just like gravity, you know, if you swap it out, at some point you're going to have to swap it in. And that's, you know, where we start to see that swapping number. And you can see for each one of these virtual machines, you've got the current amount of swapping. Uh, then you've got your swap space target. That's what it's, you know, that's what we're targeted for swap. And then your reads per second, and then your writes per second of swap. Now, whoops, this last field here. And what's another, I talked about this before, and the, the percent swap weight is it's a great indicator that there's a memory issue. Um, so it's waiting on memory for the, C, the, the CPU is in order to, per, to perform. And you can see here, notice, um, even though it's showing up in the CPU, CPU notice that the percent used and the, and the percent ready is low. All right. Uh, Brett's going to take over for now. Here you go. Yep. All right. Can you guys hear me? Good. That was a high. I don't know how that happened. All right. Um, so Steve covered uh, CPU and RAM with you guys. I'll go ahead and cover networking with you guys. So I'm also going to be covering disk with you. Now, one of the last things that you covered in memory with Steve was the fact that uh, CPU can be negatively influenced by an absence of RAM. Well, we know that when swap or ballooning occurs, the memory is moving to disk. That also has an impact on network utilization resources to get the memory out of RAM and into disk. It also has an impact on the storage I.O. because we put the memory there. If the memory is being accessed, then that increases the I.O. on the storage, which can also reduce our performance. So we definitely never want to run out of memory. And that being said, of the core four resources, when analyzing them with ESX Top, ESX Top is wonderful for CPU and RAM and disk, in my opinion. It's a little bit not, it's not the best for networking. We'll talk about what it can do for you, okay? So in terms of networking, we have a layout here of the devices and VMware networking. You've got a virtual machine's VNIC. You have a switch of some type managed by the VM kernel. And then you have your physical NICs. So what can we measure? We can measure which uplinks each virtual NIC is using. So we've... This virtual machine's VNIC is using the VM NICs at the bottom that have been identified by the relationships, by the lines. Uh, we can also identify network bandwidth per virtual NIC on a virtual machine. So we can see per VM, what is it consuming? We can see the packet count, average packet size per virtual NIC. We can see the drop packets per virtual NIC. <clears throat> In the physical side, we have the ability to measure network bandwidth per physical NIC. We can also look at... <coughs> the packet count and average packet size per physical NIC, the drop packets per physical NIC, and that's pretty much it, okay? For those of you taking pictures, go ahead and grab that one. It's, well, if I can get it to go back. There we go. All right. Because conceptually, this is what we're talking about here, all right? Everything we're going to be looking at in ESX Top relative to networking is this, all right? So when we look at it in the ESX Top, We've got a situation here where we have Linux 01, Linux 02, and these are expanded on the uh, CPU view. Now, why on earth are we looking at CPU if I'm talking about networking? CPU is the resource that is taxed for your network I.O. in your ESXi host. If you have a host that is CPU bound, it could be so constrained that network I.O. is not permitted. Storage I.O., depending on the type of storage you use, if it's software initiated or dependent iSCSI or software FCOE, then that is the potential for it to also cost you, and NFS, it will cost you CPU cycles on your ESXi host. So if you're CPU bound and having storage and network issues, we need to be able to identify that, right? So we can look at some of the overhead processes relative to a single VM. Now, if you look at the GID here, you can see 307.128 appears repeatedly. Normally there would only be one GID per VM, like with Linux 01. But you can see here, Linux 01 has 10 worlds, you can hit E to expand it by GID and see what all of the worlds are. This particular virtual machine only has one vCPU world, but it's got all of these other worlds that we can look at. We have the net world. It helps us identify some of the overhead for networking. Okay? So we look at key performance indicators in ESX Top that are relative to networking. Here, we look at two virtual machines, and this is VM-wide. So you've got workload 04, workload 05 are two different virtual machines. And I can tell which physical NIC they're utilizing and on which vSwitch they currently reside, which I should probably know that part at least already. But with NIC teaming and vSphere, 
I probably don't know which physical NIC it's using. So this is a great way to identify that. All right. I can see my network bandwidth transmitted per virtual NIC in megabits. I can see the packets transmitted per virtual NIC in megabits. I can see the average packet size transmitted per virtual NIC as well. So as we continue here, we point out vSwitches. Okay, I can see values for the vSwitch, and I can look at the same type of metrics on a per vSwitch basis. Okay? As we come in here, we've got our received network bandwidth per virtual NIC, our packets received per virtual NIC, our average packet size received per virtual NIC. And what we haven't talked about yet, but is typically your key indicator of constraint, is the drop packets. Okay? Now, if you've done any kind of deep network analysis before, you know this isn't probably where you want to be on this. So uh, this is where things like vRealize Network Log Insight come in, uh, Log Insight. Things like that are going to help you analyze this further. vRealize Operations Management. Those are tools that, in my opinion, are better for network, uh, network analysis than maybe ESXtop. Um, I do tend to go into this view if I'm using NFS storage, because this is a great place to analyze the amount of traffic being pushed through the NICs used for the storage. Okay? If we're using something like iSCSI, this could also be a consideration too. So when we continue looking at these, this time we're going to focus in on the physical NICs, just highlighting that you identify them by VM NIC, 0, 1, 2, etc. We've got network bandwidth transmitted, packets transmitted, and the average packet size. So it's really the same metrics. We're just identifying different resources that use the resource that tracks these metrics. In this case, the physical NICs. So one of the last things that we look at here is looking at the vSwitch again, looking at just different resources. Network bandwidth received, uh, packets received, uh, average packet size, and the drop packets. Once again, drop packets greater than zero generally could result in a problem. All right. Um, it doesn't, it's not guaranteed to mean a problem. Uh, we do occasionally see drop packets without having any issues whatsoever. But if it's a consistent issue and the number is very high, I would want to go investigate that further. And this is where I could identify that. So when we look at drop network packets, we point out that the packet data might be buffered before being passed to the next step in the delivery process. So as it needs to be buffered, they get buffered in queues. Queuing is not good. Eventually, if you're queuing, you're going to run into a situation where the queue overflows, and then we result in drop packets. Okay? Uh, different NICs have different queue depths. It could vary from NIC to NIC to NIC. It could be a queue depth of 32. It could be something more significant. It just depends. Now, we point out that the virtual NIC devices buffer packets when they cannot be handled immediately. So even the VNICs have the ability to buffer, but they will fill up eventually, and they can actually start dropping as well. So whenever the queues fill up, though, nothing's happening. Right? We don't want that, that to occur to us. So we look at our load-based teaming considerations, and we add physical NICs as needed. So that concludes networking. As we get into storage, storage performance, storage key performance indicators, first thing I want to talk about is where storage problems can exist. Anytime you're thinking resources in a virtualized environment, we need to be considering the fact that we've got our virtual machine consumer at the top, and we have our resource provider somewhere else. Your resource provider could be at the ESXi host, could be off on your SAN, on a LUN, elsewhere. And what we need to realize is that in the case of storage, our resource provider is actually twofold. You have the SAN and all the constructs within the SAN. Ultimately, the LUN is what we're concerned about in VMFS-based storage, or the NFS share and NFS-based storage. And in the middle, you've got the ESXi host. Well, the host has a NIC or an HBA that's being used to access that LUN. We could experience constraint on the HBA at the VM kernel level or on the actual storage device. So when you're troubleshooting storage, you need to realize this. One of the beautiful things about ESXtop in, with storage is that we're going to have the capability to identify whether or not our problem is inside the host or outside the host. So that if I'm siloed away from my storage team, I can go to them with a very informed view of what's taking place. Okay? So key performance indicators. First off, IOPS. Input outputs per second. That's how ESXtop recognizes a read or a write as an IOP. It will say it's a read or a write, and it will call it IOPS, or commands per second, CMD forward slash S. All right? uh, commands per second refers to SCSI commands per second. The next thing we have is a SCSI command. It's a read or a write. Okay? Whether you're on fiber channel, iSCSI, et cetera, it's a read or a write on the storage device. A SCSI reservation is when a LUN has to be locked for a metadata update. Okay? 
the frequency with which this occurs is significantly more rare nowadays than it was historically. Why? How many of you are familiar with the term VAI? Yeah? Okay. So VAI is a function that your array supports that VMware integrates with, and it reduces the amount of SCSI reservations. Okay? Atomic test and set would be the VAI primitive that's used for that. Latency. Ah, this is one we're familiar with, right? When it comes to storage and you have a problem, it's one of two things, right? I ran out of space, it ain't fast enough. How do I identify out of space? That's real easy. Ain't fast enough, that's latency. What we're going to do is break latency into pieces because ESX Top does that so we can identify if the storage problem is in my host or outside of my host, all right? So <clears throat> throughput was up there too, but I think you guys get that. So what we've done here is we're in the storage view and we struck the letter H, help, within ESX Top, okay? And this tells us, you can really get this from any view, it's just the help screen, okay? <clears throat> so we have three views for storage. Why do we have three views? Well, think about it. Consumer, provider. Consumer is virtual machine. If I strike lowercase v, it takes me to my virtual machine storage I.O. view. If I strike the letter D, it takes me to the device view, which is the HBA on the ESXi host. So my virtual machine storage requests, their SCSI commands, have to pass through that HBA before they can hit the LUN. And the LUN is the U, okay? Letter U, all right? Now, for this reason, you probably want your VMFS data stores backed by a single LUN. VMware supports using extents. Good luck troubleshooting extents when you've got 15 LUNs backing one data store. It gets pretty difficult, all right? I've been in situations where I had to do it, but it makes it more, tr more difficult to identify the problem. So we look at our storage key performance indicator monitoring thresholds. We introduce latency in two parts. These two metrics are latency oriented, okay? DAVG, KAVG. Now, the numbers for DAVG, 15 to 20 milliseconds. You talk to a SAN operator on a modern storage system, and he'll probably tell you he doesn't want to see greater than, or she might tell you, she doesn't want to see greater than five milliseconds latency on their storage network. So that, that number is possibly a bit antiquated. If you're running on some legacy storage, you might be more in that ballpark, all right? It just depends. So I put an asterisk next to that, next to that and said, look, it varies with application tolerance for latency. You may find you've got applications that do just fine at 10 milliseconds latency. You might have some that fail miserably at 5 milliseconds latency. It just depends how sensitive they are. So we'll talk about what these two mean in more detail, but for now I want to introduce you to the thresholds at which we're concerned when they breach the number, okay? IOPS. I want all the IOPS. Give me all the storage things. That's a good thing to have. SCSI command aborts. I want none of those, all right? SCSI command abort means we're throwing away your disk I.O. That's a bad thing. So when we look at the storage views in ESX Top, if I hit V, I can see my virtual machine. And when I look at my virtual machine, I can see the IOPS. And the IOPS is an approximation of the reads and writes per second. It's an approximate sum of the reads and writes per second. I'll get out of your way in a second, picture takers. Uh, writes per second, reads per second. This is per virtual machine, remember. I have megabytes read per second, megabytes written, and then the latency associated with these for the virtual machine, all right? As we continue, We've got the device view with the letter U, okay? And in here, we're looking at, anyone recognize this? What's this called? NAAID. This is an NAAID. Depending on the type of storage you're using, you'll have these with a different prefix than NAA. It might be T10, could be EUI, uh, various different values. What that represents, everyone, is a LUN. How many of you identify your LUNs this way? If you're not, you should be. Okay? So how do you do that effectively? Because when you look at that for the first time, you go, yeah, right, guy. There's no way I'm ever going to look at a LUN by this entire string. I'm not asking you to. Take a piece of it. Okay? You'll find that in all the LUNs you have presented, they're going to be similar up to a point. It might be in the prefix or the suffix or somewhere in the middle. There's going to be unique characters. All right? Grab those four unique characters. Append your data store names with that. By doing so, you're now training yourself every time you interact with that data store to identify the LUN in ESX Top. Otherwise, while your environment's on fire and you're trying to troubleshoot something, you're trying to correlate this by looking at data store backing in the vSphere client so that you can see which LUN backs this data store. You don't want to be in that boat. If you already know this, because every time you go work with that LUN, you have to look at those four numbers or that alphanumerical string, that's going to help you identify this. And you can see, once again, commands per second is the sum of reads and writes. Then you have your throughput. Then you have your DAVG and your KAVG. We'll talk about what those are in a second. Here we have D. 
And with D, we're just looking at the VMHBA on the ESXi host. This is the actual device that the storage I.O. has to pass through from the host to get to the LUN. All right? So here we look at the construct mapping based on what we just saw. You have V for the virtual machines at the top, D for the device, which is the middleman, and then you have the U for the LUN. All right? So this is it. <clears throat> when we look at the ESX top device, HBA view, and we zoom in on this a bit more, okay? I've got my VMHBAs. I can press H to see the values I can sort by, okay? So while you're on this view, and on each view, you can press H and see sort by values. If you don't see the entities you wish to see here, sort, and then you can change the sort value to where the, the highest consumer gets shown first or something like that, okay? And then we can see that we have GUID-based storage adapters view here. This is in the actual vSphere client, and you can see VMHBA1 there correlates to VMHBA1 here. If you're not sure which LUNs are associated with VMHBA1, go in your client, select it, and below you can hit devices. You can also hit paths to see the paths to it, and you can get some insight as to which LUNs are pushing data and I.O. through here. Remember, you're going to have lots and lots of LUNs that, are being that this device is using to access those LUNs. All right? Here we look at the LUN view. All right? So previously it was the D view. That's the device in the middle. Now we're looking at the LUN on the SAN side. And as we look at the SAN side, we have the uh, NAA ID, which would be the one that's, this is probably our SAN presented LUN here. You can see the sort values once again, and here you can see the LUNs down there. The way that I saw these LUNs was by selecting the device and then choosing the, uh, selecting the HBA and then choosing devices, and then I can see all the LUNs down there at the bottom. Okay? This helps me if I don't know the NAA ID for a LUN, this helps me to identify it very quickly. All right? The easiest way to do that though would be right click a data store, go to properties and go look at the data store backing value. That will immediately give you its NAA ID and then you can go identify it in the SX top like this so you can analyze it. How do I know when I need to look at a LUN? Well, the virtual machines on that LUN are having a problem. That's usually where you're going to find out first. Hey, this app isn't working well. Okay, it looks like CPU network and disk are fine. CPU network and RAM are fine. Maybe it's disk. So you go check it out here because the LUN is the provider. All right? If the HBA looks good, it's not saturated. The LUN's got to be what's next. Okay? So we look at the ESX top VM view. One of the things that we want to show you here is the fact that we have the ability down here. This is the big takeaway on this slide. Down here, I can select one of these GIDs, and just like we did in CPU, and we expanded it and saw all of the worlds associated with it and the number of vCPUs individually in CPU, you can do that with disks. You're going to have virtual machines typically with more than one disk. So having one row that represents all the I.O. on that virtual machine's disks does me no good. I want to see the individual VMDKs. If I have an OS disk that does nothing all day, and I've got three data disks that push 1,000 IOPS on average and peak to 15,000, this is where I come to see what the individual disks are doing. Now, if your disks are distributed across different LUNs, you need to know that as well, all right? Because then you need to go analyze the different LUNs from the view we were looking at previously, all right? So I can see that this is two separate VMDKs. We don't acknowledge them through a VMDK identifier, we're recognizing them by their SCSI ID that's been assigned within vSphere. And you can identify this by right-clicking the VM, choosing edit settings, and looking. This is a VM that only has one storage controller installed, okay? And it's got two devices on that storage controller, zero and one. So latency explored. Why have I not talked about the values of latency? <laughs> because I wanted to show you this slide that helps us visualize it immediately. What we've explored thus far with latency is the actual numerical values where we get concerned. Okay, we said two to three milliseconds for KVG. We said 15 to 20 milliseconds, but realistically today with technology, much, much more aggressive, probably about five milliseconds on an all-flash array. Um, but that's the DAVG. So let's talk about what all of these are. First off, GAVG is the guest average command latency experience. It is the sum of all latencies that the guest experiences in the round trip time for the I.O. having left the VM, touching the LUN, and coming back to the VM. Okay? So the rest of it is just pieces of that that add to that sum. So when we talk about KVG, it's the kernel average command latency, VM kernel managed. So the moment that we have a vSCSI command exit the virtual storage controller on the virtual machine, we start counting the latency until it is actually handed off to the driver for the HBA. This space right here is KAVG. This should be immediate, okay? 
We'll talk about what it means when one of these is high and the other one is low, and we'll draw a correlation on the last slide. All right, so KVG is your kernel average command latency. All right, VM kernel, how long is it hanging on to this? Now, why would this increase? What if it tries to hand it off to the driver on the HBA, and the HBA says, no, I'm queuing right now? Well, guess what? This is going to be increasing. This is going to start increasing. Anytime that we can't hand that off to the driver immediately, we're starting to count that up. Now, this could be because the device on the ESI host doesn't have enough throughput. You might need to upgrade that device, or you don't have enough of devices split with your uh, multipathing policies. Okay? But we could identify that from analyzing in this space with that metric, KVG. All right? The next thing we look at is the rest of the trip for this piece of I.O. This I.O. has to go all the way to the LUN and come back. Well, once it leaves the host on the adapter, we have no idea what's happening with it. What we can do is say, I sent it off, and I'm waiting to hear back from it. And we start counting the latency on that experience. And that is your physical device average command latency. It's the amount of time from the moment it was handed off to the HBA on the ESXi host to where it goes to the LUN and successfully returns to the host. That's it. Okay? So that's what those metrics are, and you can analyze that from all three of the views. So correlation between these. What does it mean when devices on the LUN, the VM, or SCSI I.O., I should say, on the LUN, the VM, or on the uh, HPA actually have high or low values for KVG and DAVG? How do we draw a correlation for those? Okay? First up, if you have a high physical device average command latency and low kernel average command latency, Remember, ESXtop is a per-host tool. This doesn't mean every host is experiencing this. So if my LUN has high latency, eventually my hosts who are being told, you can't send anything else to this LUN, my hosts are going to start queuing. And this condition will usually result in both of the values rising eventually, with your device average command latency starting first, and then your kernel average command latency trailing, because we can't access the device over here. All right? This could indicate an overworked array. Doesn't have to be that way, but it could. When we look at high kernel average command latency, low physical device average command latency. So I've got an overworked host. Let's elaborate on that, though. If the kernel latency is high, the physical demand command, physical, com, physical command latency is low. Yeah, for the LUN. Anyway, if we can't get to the LUN, but we're not getting out of the ESXi host, the LUN is doing fine. It's got throughput to give. It's got I.O. to give. Getting out of the ESXi host is the problem for us. What that tells me is my HPA is insufficient, probably. Okay? Um, it could be, if the host is CPU bound, and I use software-initiated iSCSI, that we have so many CPU cycles being consumed, storage I.O. is not getting processed. That could be a problem, too. So don't just assume that it's one thing, but more, most commonly, this is because you don't have enough throughput available on the actual device. Okay? If they're both high, the problem could be on one side or the other. <laughs> so that means you've got to do troubleshooting on both sides. All right? uh, if they're both low, that's the ideal situation that we all want. That means our I.O. is healthy, and we don't have to worry about it at all. Okay? All right. So here we've got our additional education resources. If there are any questions, you're all welcome to ask questions. Once again, my name is Brett Garino. Steve Baca did the CPU and RAM, the compute part. I did the I.O. part. And thank you, Steve. And if anyone has any questions whatsoever, you may ask them now, or feel free to stick around and catch us, and we'll sit down and talk about anything, any concerns that you have. Okay? Thank you.